Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast, the resource for transitional and experienced genealogists who want to create a successful business. I'm your host, Miriam Pierre-Louis. Here you'll learn from professionals all around the world who work in the field of genealogy. Are you ready to learn and grow together? Then let's get started. This podcast is sponsored in part by the Association of Professional Genealogists. You can find out more about them at www.apgen.org. Welcome to Episode 16 of the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Today, we head to Ireland to chat with genealogist Fiona Fitzsimons. Fiona, welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Hi, Marion. Thank you very much for asking me to speak today. Today also happens to be St. Patrick's Day. We saved our first Irish episode for St. Patrick's Day, Uh, so it only seemed appropriate to head to Ireland at this time because you know uh, Americans, we're we're a little bit obsessed with the Irish. Let's get started by having you tell us about yourself and give us an overview of your genealogy business. Thanks, Marion, for asking that. Um, The genealogy business is the well of Enoclan, we established Anaclan in 1998 as a Trinity College campus company. So Brian Donovan, my my boyfriend at the time, now my husband, and I, um, we were coming out of the School of History, and we wanted to use the skills that we had learned there and to try and monetize those because we had become, to some extent, disencha- disenchanted with uh, academia, and we didn't want to go into the the usual options that were there, um, which was working in the senior civil service or working um, as business consultancy. We, we kind of liked the idea of working for ourselves. Genealogy was the driving force because that was what the, um, there was an existing audience for that. And because we were coming from Trinity College, we offered something which was new in that uh, we offered a very deep knowledge of records, but also a deep coverage of the records, which we thought at the time was was fairly unique. We could cover 400 years because a lot of genealogists tend to be, um, they tend to focus in on maybe um, a 100 year or 150 year period. We started out then providing a genealogy business. And from that, we grew other parts of the business, including archives and records management, which we provide for government departments, large law firms, larger corporate businesses. We've been involved in one of the largest ever disaster recovery projects for the uh, Department of Defence here in Ireland. We've also been involved in providing archives for the Department of Health and Children, children raised in care in Ireland from approximately the 1930s right the way through up to the 1990s. So in a way, this is another kind of skill which we learned in the School of History in Trinity. But very early on, Brian also recognized, and I have to admit it's something that he recognized before I did, the web was still new in those days and the web was crying out for content. And he recognized that historic records were one of the key things that could be used to plug this hole. Basically, to digitize and index records, put them up online and to then sell subscriptions to people who wanted to trace their own family history. But like I say, genealogy researching other people's family history on on a commission basis. It has always been the driving element. In a sense, it's what unites all the disparate parts of the business. Uh, Fiona, I want to go back to when you were at university. Was the focus on history, or were you also at the same time doing genealogical research, personal research, or for your own family? I'm just trying to see where the the genealogy came in. Uh, Was it there first, or was it there after the business idea? I think what first inspired me to become a genealogy professional was that I could earn some pocket money while I was a graduate student. And anyone who's been a student knows it's probably the time in your life when you are most broke. And it was even just to have money in my pocket so I could go out and meet my friends on Friday or Saturday night. The, a number of people in university, a number of the professors were interested in tracing family history, usually visiting professors who were over for six months or a year. And they contacted the research library, which is where the graduate students would all have uh, been based doing their research. And they asked for a good graduate student who would do reliable research. And my name was put forward by... Um, by the research librarian at the time. So in a way, I stepped into genealogy almost by accident. 
And at the same time, I was also asked to uh, take on a couple of guided tours of Dublin, and again from the historic point of view. So I've actually given a couple of Nobel Prize winners who were visiting Trinity tours around historic Dublin. Some of them, it was, some of them absolutely loved the whole history side of things, and that's what they wanted to focus on. Others were interested in the wider culture. One little trick I picked up very, very quickly was to walk by St. Patrick's Cathedral around or about 4, 4 p.m. and to drop in for Evensong. So it's almost an accidental falling into genealogy. That's really interesting. I've never actually had anybody say that to me before. I'm assuming that because you're doing history at university, that you're not in a business program, right? You're not taking business courses. So you and your partner get this idea to start a business after you graduate. What do you do to make up that for that lack of business know-how that you haven't? You've been trained in the history, but what about the business side of it? How did you... How did you prepare yourself for that? Well, to some extent, I think my mother had prepared me. My mother had a degree in business, and she actually taught entrepreneurial skills post-leaving cert, so post-high school, and it would have been the first entrepreneurial skills course taught in Ireland at that time. And it was picked up on by the University of Limerick, Joyce O'Connor, who subsequently brought in an awful lot of what my mother had uh, had developed into part into her course. My mother actually advised her on that. So in a sense, from a very, very early age, from the time I was 10, 11, 12, I was taught about innovation. I was taught that being an entrepreneur wasn't simply about, in fact, being involved in in business, but it was about, say, taking an existing idea sometimes and trying to find a better way of a better way of doing it. I was also taught that uh, entrepreneurial skills weren't simply about um, business. They could also be about social innovation. So that's the first thing that I got from home. I was always really encouraged that the best way to learn was self-learning and to pick up and do it. But Trinity, when they realized the idea, apparently we generated an awful lot of discussion, should we or shouldn't we try and uh, support these young people and get involved in setting up a business. And the director of the Innovation Center, Dr. Professor Owen O'Neill, was Um, apparently tickled pink by the idea of what was at that time Europe's first ever humanities-based campus company. And he provided us with support. He entered us on a business program, the Campus Company Development Program, which is run by the National University of Ireland and by Trinity. We entered that in 1998. And in fact, we won the top prize that year. I think people were surprised to see a campus company coming out of the humanities because at that stage, of course, we were all used to, um, we were already used to companies coming out from the tech side of things, either IT or from medicine, or by that time there was even a pickup from genetics. But we would have been the first from the humanities across Europe as well. We used to get wheeled out on a regular basis whenever there was a visiting delegation from the European Parliament. And that was great experience for us because given who they were, they were both, they were very, very supportive of two young people who were trying something new, which hadn't been tried anywhere else across Europe. But um, it also gave us a real audience that we had to um, describe what we were doing, tell them what we were doing, and get across the fact that we had a real business here and that there were real prospects of growth. So you got a lot of practice explaining exactly what you were doing. Yes. I I joked with Owen years later, I was asked to uh, speak at his retirement too, and I joked that Professor O'Neill looked at myself and Brian and thought, well, if I can turn these two into a viable business, I could do it for anybody. I think we were just a real challenge to him. I am imagining that many of the people in your history program at Trinity went on to become professors or teachers or something like that. I wouldn't imagine with a course like that, a program like that, that they're churning out business people. So are you too unique coming out of that program with this business idea? In some ways, we are unique. But I remember the very first week I was in Trinity, you have to remember that Trinity is an elite college. And the majority of people who would have completed history degrees would have gone on either into the senior civil service or into the corporate world. The single biggest employer of history graduates in the 80s and the early 90s was merchant banking. I think what is unique about us is that we set up a business which was based on what we had actually learned within the School of History, that the skills we're actually employing are analytical skills, writing skills, but also using research, harnessing research, and then harnessing archival archival experience and knowledge, but also our knowledge of the records, creating a business out of that. I think that's what's different about what we do. Clarify one thing for me. Is Enenclan 
part of Trinity University or is it a completely independent and separate company? Anaclan is a completely separate company okay. from Trinity. We developed out of the School of History and Trinity retains a small shareholding. Tell me about when you first open your business. I'm imagining it's just you and Brian, just the two of you. How quickly did you grow? What did you do at the beginning? How did you let people know you were open for service? And where did your business come from? Uh, Were there many Americans who contacted you or was it Irish focused? What was it like right in that first year? Well, in the first year, we were in a small room, an office which was the size of a broom cupboard. It basically had enough space for a table and two computers and bookshelf. In that first year, right from the get-go, we aimed ourselves entirely at the overseas market. We actually recognized the power of the web. And that might sound... That might sound very um, everyday now in uh, 2014, but this would have been back. Enaclan had a prehistory of two years. So back in 1996 and 1997, we realized very early on that we could create a web page, that we could uh, create a web page by which we actually offered historical research. And that was initially how we reached our audience. So we were aiming it very definitely at an overseas market, particularly Americans, um, Australians, New Zealanders, Canadians. But in that first year alone, we also picked up people from South America. And we even had one client from one of the polar research stations, when, proving the power of the web to actually connect people. So did so you did you strictly promote yourself on the web? Or did you do advertisements in print magazines or outreach of any other sort? In the first year, the only kind of outreach we had would have been, um, there were a couple of newspaper articles. Now, We were very lucky. We got uh, newspaper articles in the national newspapers who were saying, look, isn't this interesting? Something which hasn't been done before. But you have to remember, all of this was before the web, before people really caught on to the idea of using the web to monetize a particular set of skills or to create a business. I remember back in 1998-99, Brian being invited to a meeting with the heads of all the banks in Ireland at that time. Brian and myself were invited. We were sitting around the table listening to all these people who were theorizing how you might actually arrange for payments, whether or not there was uh, all the different pitfalls of uh, doing something, selling it online. And then then Professor Owen O'Neill, who was chairing the conversation, said, well, I have to my right here two people who actually have been doing this for the last year and a half. And we were asked to speak. And at that time, sitting around that table with the heads of all the major banks in Ireland, we were the only two people at that table who actually understood e-commerce because we had, at that time, a year and a half's practical experience of doing this, of promoting ourselves and selling ourselves via the web. So I suppose a lot of it, another thing I should say, a lot of it was word of mouth. We got a lot of personal recommendations. There was no electronic payment at this time, right? So the the e-commerce aspect of it is the business is e-commerce, but was a payment still via check or wire or something like that? Exactly. We had a little credit card slip. People could phone in their their card details. Mm -hmm. Um, Even to get that, we had to go, we had to jump through a number of hoops just to get that. A couple of banks turned us down initially. They were concerned we might be money laundering, which considering the tiny sums of money we were taking in at that time, it seems if that had been the case, we would have been the worst money launderers in history. But it was just, it's this fear of the unknown. E-commerce really was, it, it was a revolution in terms of how people do business. And the banks, funnily enough, were, this, were, were very, very slow to cotton on to that. Can you share a story of an obstacle or a challenge that you encountered in those first couple years and how you worked around it? Because not everything goes smoothly right from the start. I think as we started to grow, one of the biggest challenges we faced was cash flow. And I remember at a particular point in time, we were owed €120,000 and we owed the revenue. And the revenue always have to get paid maybe half of that, 60000 But in order to be paid, we needed a tax clearance certificate, which ran over a particular time. And so uh, without that, we couldn't get the money in. And unless we got the money in, we couldn't pay out. And the obstacle, that was the obstacle, cash flow. And the way we actually uh, got over it is we went and we talked directly to the revenue and we negotiated with them that we would put in a system of payments. So I think one of the earliest and one of the most important lessons that we learned was to develop a good working relationship with the revenue. The government always has to get paid. But the fact is when they can see you coming in, when they see that you are reliable in that way, they, they will often help to meet that cash flow difficulty by, for example, putting in a monthly system of payments. 
so it worked well for us. Uh, let's talk about when your business started to really come together. Um, you're starting to hire staff and you're not having the cash flow problems anymore. Describe what that felt like and what your vision was at that point for where you wanted to take the business. At that moment in time, I think the single, the, the greatest sense I had was the importance of, I suppose, staying on top. There were so many things happening. And given the academic training that both Brian and I had received, we we were used to learning something very deeply, very thoroughly and having control of it. So one of the first things we had to learn once everything began coming together was to, to try and delegate more and delegate better. And I would say that's something I still have a problem with <laughs> to the present day, as some of my colleagues might actually report as well. So how did we how did we work around that? Well, we made some very good decisions at the beginning. We hired some uh, very, very good people. And in fact, the core of the Anaclan staff who would have been recruited in 98 to 99 are with us down to the present day. And considering that Anaclan has been through a boom and a bust, that's something I'm personally very, very proud of. We've managed to hold on to really first-rate people by creating what I what I like to think of is a, a positive working environment where everyone actually has has an input and has has a voice that will be listened to. So that was the first really good thing that we did. Now, we also had, we made very many errors, but we never made errors that were so serious that we couldn't recover from them. And I suppose that's one of the second things, gaining the confidence to to make those kind of errors and making so many errors that I stopped beating myself myself up over it and just learn to relax and treat it as just that's something I had to learn. Okay, I'd like to ask a question about you personally in terms of the growth of the business because you said you don't like to delegate. You brought on a number of employees. How do No, it's not Mary, it's not that I don't like oh. to delegate, but I think I'm just it, Given my training as a, I was trained as a medieval Irish historian, so I was used to doing everything from start to finish. Okay. When you needed to, you know, you had to learn, you had to learn all the different little inputs yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, it was always important to me to have a level of control. Now, in, in the course of running a business, I have, I have learned to delegate. Every now and again, I have to uh, pinch myself and remind myself that I'm not here to do everything from mm -hmm. beginning to end. We have a team here in Anaclan. So how did you determine when you started to bring people on what the new employees would do and, and you know, what would you focus on? How, how did your role change when these new staff members um, came on and could help with the load? Well, it took me out of the archives and it put me more into administration. And that is one of the things I found very difficult because uh, I love research. I love being in archives. To this day, I think I don't get out into archives as often as I might otherwise like. I have often found that working with, working with other historians and working with other genealogists, what we have tried to do is we've tried to bring people in who, who have different areas of speciality. So that, for example, we're not taking in everyone who has a speciality in the 18th or 19th century. We do like to take people in who've got a minimum undergraduate degree in history and usually a master's as well, either in history or a related subject. Um, we like people who have a couple of publications under their belt. I like where somebody has maybe um, got a couple of years work experience in different parts of the business. And I like somebody who has strong ideas. One thing we try and encourage in Anaclan is that everyone everyone contributes and everyone adds their tuppence worth, that it's not just top down, it's not just me setting the agenda and everybody follows, that when you have a good idea, you basically uh, bring it forward, be that in a research project or be that in when we are talking methodology, because that's another thing that we actually do, it's another system which is developed within Anaclan, and that is that we often discuss case studies. At this stage, we've done thousands of commissions, and we very often will come up again with similar genealogical conundrums. And when you have a team like that, particularly a team who have worked together since 1998, 99, it's a really good idea to harness those skills by trying to create these uh, case study discussions, where if something, if a similar type of case crops up, somebody who's worked on something similar at a previous time can say, well, the last time I worked on a similar kind of case, a canal family or a railway family, I managed to crack it by going through the methodology and also the particular sets of records, for example. Where does uh, writing and writing articles and public speaking fit in in your business. Does everyone in Anaclan participate in those activities or is it restricted to just you or certain people? 
everyone in Anaclan is encouraged to do those things. Now, the fact is, everyone has a mind of their own, and I'm not going to force anyone to do something they don't want to. But I do think that presentation skills are key to what we do, whether you're, whether that is presentation to an individual client, to a, an extended family who might commission a piece of research. I also think that you only really fully understand an idea or a concept yourself if you can explain it clearly and in a comprehensive manner to other people. So I strongly encourage everyone working in the genealogy department in Anaclan to give public papers and to write articles. After that, it's up to the person themselves what it is, whether or not they feel confident to stand up in front of a public audience. My colleague, Carmel Gilbride has given papers in National Library and also before the Irish Family History Society. Another colleague, I hope, is going to give a presentation this year on his particular area of speciality, which would be uh, land records. So we're hoping to uh, do that in the first half of the year. We were talking about it before Christmas. I think as well that when you write an article, you're communicating with a wider audience. And I think that can only reflect well in terms of how you write for individual clients. Where do you and Enon Clan fit in to the international genealogical community? Is your focus strictly on Ireland or the U- Ireland and the UK? Or do you interface at all with people in America or in continental Europe in terms of conferences or perhaps uh, joint projects, developing standards or anything like that? Well, that's really interesting you raised that. For the last 10 years, I've been very much Irish-focused. And part of the reason for that are Brian and I have uh, three boys, aged nine, seven, and, and two. So I've been very much home-focused, uh, looking after the kids. I've recently begun looking outwards and, I suppose, interfacing, meeting up with genealogists in the UK and in the US. This year, I'm speaking at Who Do You Think You Are in London in February. I was also recently elected to the Board of Directors of the Association of Professional Genealogists. And in fact, I've just returned about a week and a half ago from Salt Lake City for the first board meeting of 2014. And for me, it was a fantastic trip. I came back, despite the almost a day's journey back and a seven-hour time difference, I came back invigorated. I'd met so many like-minded people. I'm very, very interested in terms of communicating much more and being part of an international genealogy community. I'm particularly interested in in two areas. One is the area of ethics, because I think we've seen such a huge growth in genealogy. I think it's very, very important that we um, maintain ethical standards and standards of research. And the second area that I'm I'm keenly interested in is education. And I suppose to some extent that, that comes back to my whole, my start in all of this was in a university. I was training as an academic. But it also comes back to I've got a real commitment to raising standards, but also to sharing information. Get the information out there about what sources there are. Back in 98, 99, 2000, when before I had my children and I was attending international conferences, very often the first question we were asked was, how can you do genealogy? How can you do genealogy in Ireland when there are no Irish records? So the very first thing we had to get across to people was, okay, the 19th century census has been destroyed almost in its entirety, but there are still records there. And you can trace your Irish family. It's possible to trace almost every Irish family back to the 1830s. I think we've got that message out now. And in part, that's been because we've had a digital revolution in Irish family history. At this stage, there's now over 100 million unique Irish records available online through websites like irishgenealogy.ie, which is a free government website, findmypast.ie, and irishorigins and ancestry.com. I think the proof is in the pudding. People can see now that there are very many Irish records out there. But now I think we need to communicate to people, these are the sources and this is the way that you can squeeze every last drop of information out of them. I love attending I love attending conferences because it's a great way of meeting other genealogists, meeting up with like-minded people who um, who take it as seriously as I do. Do you have a line of communication open with let's just say American genealogists because I'm in America, but this could just as easily be with Australian genealogists. You've got professionals over there who are kind of on the on the first line of Irish immigrants researching their ancestors and then working their way back to perhaps your services in Ireland. Do you have that line of communication open with professionals in other parts of the world? Yes, we do. 
And part of that has been that I suppose Enaclan is the largest company of its kind in Ireland. And even when I was at home with young children, my husband and other Enaclan, other members of Enaclan were attending these conferences. So we always had people who were aware that uh, Enaclan was here, that I was still involved in the genealogy side of things. But we've also been involved with TV programs like Who Do You Think You Are, uh, Finding Your Roots and Faces of America. And working on programs like that, we've worked with teams of other genealogists across oceans. We've been working on from our point of view, we usually pick up the research at the point that the uh, the genealogists in the country of immigration stop when they trace the individual, the immigrant ancestor. And at that point, they pass the information on to us and we pick up. So that's one way. I've also been asked to contribute to a number of journals and magazines. So in a way, that's put me continuously in contact with the editors of those magazines. But then also, uh, I get a small post bag. And I love... I find this is the real payoff for for writing articles when somebody reads my article and actually emails me. Now, I don't mind if someone emails me to say they disagree or they think I'm wrong. In fact, that can be the start of a great discussion. What I'm interested in hearing is that somebody has actually read the article and that it interested them sufficiently that they decided to write to me afterwards. What's the most fun project that you've ever worked on that you can share with us? God, that I can share with you. That's actually an interesting one. We've worked on a range of projects that I loved. We worked on, I worked on the film Albert Nobbs a while back, directed by Rodrigo Garcia Marquez, starring Glenn Close and Maya Wasgaski. That was fun because I described that to a friend as being like historical Sudoku. I took all of the many incidental things I had picked up in doing genealogical research, the kind of social history aspect, and I was asked to, in practical terms, provide the social history background to Albert Nobbs to describe, for example, social conventions of people staying at a hotel, to describe things like um, what would you see in the streets outside the hotel, in the back streets, but also in things like the, the street singers or people who said poetry at street corners, street urchins. I was also asked to come up with things, for example, what would you expect to see on the table? of uh, on a dining table for breakfast for dinner for tea and that was particularly that particularly stretched my ingenuity because you were suddenly thinking back to communications but in its rawest sense communications and also transport what was actually being brought in being imported from abroad so that was a fun project to be involved in it was also fantastic to see it on on screen to realize it on screen I was seven months, eight months pregnant at the time with my youngest child. And I remember the crew turning around to me and saying to me that the director had had told them if she can turn up, we had very, very heavy snows at the time and people found it difficult to get into the city centre. But apparently the director said, well, if Fiona can turn up at seven and eight months pregnant, then there's no excuse for the rest of you. So the crew turned around and asked me if I'd stay in bed one or two mornings just to cut them some slack. (laughs) Did you do that? No, I'm afraid. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm happiest when, when... I'm busy, so um, so I, no 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 extended stays in the scratcher. What else? I've worked on some I've worked on some amazing projects. Not all of them. I mean, obviously, I always remember the "Who do you think you are?" is because you're dealing with very often stars of stage or screen. But one of the ones that I most enjoyed was a a family by the name of Haddon, who the family had, I think, seven sons, of whom six became doctors. And the last and youngest one of these doctors qualified in 1844, the year before the start of the famine. And as I researched, as I researched uh, this individual, I found he had been assigned to Skibbereen, which was one of the, it was a remote country district, one of the areas worst hit by the famine in the uh, in 1845-46. I was struck by what he did. He worked all day in the dispensary. A full day working from um, nine until five or six. And he then closed the dispensary, went home, had his dinner. But he then took his cart out. And in fact, all the dispensary doctors in Skibbereen were noted for doing this. They then took out their horse and traps and they traveled out to the more remote areas. And they traveled up into the mountains and into areas where people who were too ill to actually get up and walk down into the town, who were too ill to travel. They visited them in their homes. And when I say homes, I'm talking about one and two room houses, walls of mud, thatched roofs. And in fact, this doctor had picked up cholera, I think, from um, going out and from attending some of these patients. He was almost given up for dead, but he was nursed back to health. And as soon as he recovered his health, 
he picked up and did the exact same thing again. And I was very, very struck by, I suppose you could say, just his sense of public duty. And this is what he was trained in. He was a doctor. And he was prepared to put himself on the line because he realized there were people who actually required a doctor's help who couldn't always travel because they lived so remotely and because they were sick. But they still required a doctor's care and attention. So that was one of the ones that I was most deeply moved by. That's an incredible story. Uh, where is that? Is that on, on Who Do You Think You Are, or where is that broadcast or published? No, that's not. Uh, that wasn't for one of the Who Do You oh. Think You Are. Is I, I actually deliberately was. Uh, that wasn't Who Do You Think You Are. That was a private commission from okay. an American family who were okay. descended from uh, this guy. I I mention it because it's one of those that um, where an individual from almost from beyond from beyond the grave, I, I found. I had a very clear sense of this person from some of his letters, which I had read, which I'd later read, but also from, um, and from his children's letters afterwards. It was one of my favorites because I was touched by his humanity. It sounds like it might make a nice article or a short documentary to share his story. Personally, I'd love to make short documentaries with stories like that. I think, who do you think you are? On the one hand, it's great, but um, there are very, very many more stories beyond simply um, the great and the good of this genera- of any generation. You know, ordinary people's lives. When you sit down at conferences, when, after all the papers have been given and after everyone has given their little public presentation, when genealogists themselves get together, this is very often what you actually hear them coming out with. It's the stories they found most interesting, and they're not always attached to a celebrity. Wonderful stuff. Let's take a quick break to hear a message from the Association of Professional Genealogists. Hello. This is Kimberly Powell, President-Elect of the Association of Professional Genealogists. APG is an international membership organization dedicated to supporting all individuals in the business of genealogy, whether you're an archivist, librarian, educator, writer, or researcher. Our 2,600 members include genealogists at all stages of their professional careers, from those just starting out to some of the field's most renowned leaders. Learn how to grow your business and network with other professionals through our educational webinars, informal mentoring groups, active discussion lists, the APG Quarterly, and our annual professional management conference. Visit us online at apgen.org to learn how we can help you on your professional journey and how you can help us advance public awareness and understanding of the profession of genealogy. All right, Fiona, we are now going to enter the lightning round. And this is where I am going to bombard you with a bunch of quick questions. And you are going to come back with some brilliant answers that are going to provide advice for all of the genealogists that are listening to this interview. Are you ready? What was the one thing you were most afraid of in starting your business? Public speaking. (laughs) And to this day, it's the thing that I take a deep breath before I get up and do it. I think nerves are essential. It's part of keying you up, getting you ready for a performance. But um, I still find it difficult. If you talk to many, many genealogists, though, I I hear the same thing from them. What is the best advice you've ever received? The best advice I ever received was from Dr. Charles Benson, who was the keeper of early printed books in Trinity College. And he was one of my key mentors. And he told me back, (laughs) back in the day, he told me, you have to know the politics of any organization sufficiently well that you don't just step into it unawares. But if you're smart, you will not get drawn into the politics. You'll use your knowledge of what's going on to avoid being drawn into the arguments. In your case, what type of organizations, because you wouldn't have to worry about politics of any clan, so I'm imagining you're talking about banks that you're dealing with or government or something like that. Well, no. Um, Enaclan, very often we do a lot of archival and records management business. So uh, we would work out in government departments, but also in larger corporate firms. And sometimes you can walk into a, a situation where there's a dispute between Mr. Brown and Mr. Black, which has been going on for 20 years earlier. And that can even boil down to how they want their archives organized, cleaned and tidied away. And it's just being aware enough of your surroundings that you don't put your foot into things. Yeah, I think it's great advice. And uh, thank you for giving an example, because that makes it very clear. What is one specific action that listeners can take in the next 24 hours to help them transition into a genealogy career? 
Well, I would say the one specific action that listeners could take would be to familiarize themselves with Irish genealogy websites. We've had a digital revolution in Irish family history in the last 10 years. And I like to think that Enaclan was very much at the forefront. The first publication we ever prepared was um, 100,000 wills and testamentary records, the index of Irish wills in the National Archives. But we were also part of the group who, in 2002-2003, digitized and indexed Griffith's valuation and put it up online. Now, at this point, there are now over 100 million unique Irish records which are available online. There are a multiplicity of websites, but I think that there are four or five key websites. And for anyone who wants to get involved in Irish genealogy, the first thing I would say is familiarize yourself with those websites. Findmypast.ie, irishorigins.com, irishgenealogy.ie. They would be um, some of the key ones. Get to learn the strengths and weaknesses of each website. Do you have a productivity tool or an app like Dropbox that you love and that you can share with the audience? Well, I love Dropbox because it's a very easy way of um, passing around a, um, a large image Um, For example, family trees. Sometimes in some of the family histories I would be working on, I might have up to, I might have a few hundred people in them. If I'm sending something like that via email, it's liable to uh, stall my entire system. Dropbox gets me around that difficulty. Any other apps that you love and can't live without? Not really. Mm-hmm. I My eldest son is nine, almost ten, and I have only recently reclaimed my my iPad, <laughs> so I'm, I'm re-familiarizing myself with, with apps. What is your preferred social media channel, or don't you do social media? I am certainly interested in social media. I like YouTube because of the immediacy, and also because it helps me to keep the kids entertained. The truth of the matter is I, I don't really have that much downtime, mm-hmm. and when I do... I like to read. So I, so in that, I'm very analog. Okay. I love a book. And I always read an actual book, not a Kindle. Well, this segues perfect into our next question. If you can recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be? No, that is a curious one. Um, if I could recommend one book for your listeners, it wouldn't, in fact, be an Irish history book. I think I would recommend anything by uh, Jorge Luis Borges, For the simple sense, his understanding of what an archive or what a library was. And Borges was the director of the National Library of Argentina. Now, I don't think the National Library ever got much of a look in. I think he focused entirely on his writing. But he understood a library or an archive as almost a a mirror which reflected back the idea of a society in it. I just think it's a very culturally rich understanding of what an archive or a library can be and what it contains. And I love his stories. They're also, some of them are quite short, so it's possible to uh, squeeze them in between tea time and bath time. And I'm afraid I'm very much a working mother, so um, it's always a matter of squeezing in what I can do in between those personal demands on me by my children. Okay, now I've got a hypothetical scenario for you. You have to move to France. You're leaving everyone in an clan behind. Uh, you're not familiar with the research or the records. You cannot do anything related to Ireland. What are you going to do in France in the first month to hit the ground running and start a new genealogy business? In the first month in France, I would probably apply for my reader's ticket for the Bibliothèque Nationale. And France is such a bureaucratic country, it would probably take me at least a month to actually get the reader's ticket. Well, let, well let's say that you got it magically in a day, what would you then do to get your business going? I think the next thing I do, I would do is I'd make sure I had good broadband and I would uh, link up to the online sites. Curiously, most of the focus of digitizing and indexed records has been on records of the English-speaking world. So there's been a huge focus in terms of records of Ireland, England, America, Canada. And I hope in the next generation that the same companies who are driving these, who are driving this push for digitization, will start focusing on records of other European and including Eastern European countries, and also possibly Russia, the former Soviet countries, and maybe moving into the Middle East. And if anyone out there is looking for someone to help digitize the Italian records, 
I'd love to actually have an excuse to, to live and work in Italy for a few years. Well, you never know. It's Liz- very tongue-in-cheek, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. The south of France could be calling me. <laughs> I, I, always, <laughs> you. I always tell my husband that, you know, a year in France, that would not be a problem. All right, give our audience one parting piece of advice and then tell us how we can get in contact with you. I think the best advice I could give to any other professional genealogist who maybe is at a point now where they are just starting off is to keep detailed research notes. Um, and that would include both full or partial transcripts of uh, any documents recorded, but also the manuscript sources and the document call numbers in the archives or libraries or repositories where you found them. You will actually find that over the years, you actually build up your own personal research library. And very often when I'm having difficulty with a piece of research, I will often remember something, a similar kind of case that I worked on at this stage now, 5, 10, and even 20 years back. And by going through the, the Rolodex of my mind, I can usually come up with who that was, where it was, and I can go back to the original case file and I can pull out the research notes So stay on top of your own records and remember that in the course of doing your research, in the course of uh, doing your own casework, you're building up your own research library. It should be a reference library for, for yourself in the years to come. And how can we get in contact with you? Probably the easiest way to contact me is through the Enaclan website, www enaclan.ie and I better spell that because it's an Irish word so most people, even Irish, wouldn't be used to it E for elephant N for Nora E C L A N N dot I-E You can also contact us through the uh, Enaclan Facebook And I'm not sure if we mentioned this earlier but you were actually at um, an APG meeting earlier this year so maybe folks will get the opportunity to see you at an APG meeting or conference in the future sometime? I certainly hope so. I'm going to be back in America in August. Um, There's another APG meeting in San Antonio in Texas, I believe. Oh, FGS. That's right. But my husband and I are also traveling over for the Tiara event in Boston. Then I will have the chance to meet you. Fantastic. I look forward to that. Um, We'll be a bit of a traveling circus. My Husband and I will be traveling with our three boys, who are, um, three boys under 10. So, Wonderful. Watch out for the Donovans. <laughs> Fiona Fitzsimons, thank you so much for coming on the Genealogy Professional Podcast today. Marion, thanks you very much for asking me. For our first trip to Ireland, we had an amazing trip. We learned all about the development of Enninclan, the largest genealogy company in Ireland, We learned a lot about the online resources that are available for Irish research. We heard some wonderful stories about specific projects that related to Ireland. And we got some great advice from Fiona Fitzsimons. And it's that last piece of advice that she had for the listeners of the Genealogy Professional Podcast that I'd like to focus in today for our action item for this week. Fiona said to keep detailed research notes. She said you're building up your own research library. And in that particular case, Fiona was referring to a library of your past experience, your research projects. And and that's a tremendous value to draw from the own work that you've done. But there's also another kind of library that you should have, and that is your reference library. And everyone's reference library is going to be different depending on where in the world they live and what their research specialties are. They might focus on an ethnic uh, research specialty such as Italian or German or Dutch, and so they need books on that topic. And depending on what country you're in, you're going to need either British books or American books or Australian books. So what I'd like you to do this week is to come up with a list of 10 books that are essential for your personal research library. What are the books that you need to have at hand available to you at any time of day or night so that you can be the best genealogist that you can be and you can do the best work that you can do and have the information available to you at all times. Now, my 
library is rather large because I'm a bit of a book hoard. But I was also lucky enough to inherit all of my mom's genealogy books because she was a genealogist as well. And that helped a lot in terms of increasing my library. But let's see, six of the top books that I would have in my library would include uh, Professional Genealogy, edited by Elizabeth Schoen Mills, Red Book, American States, County and Town Sources, published by Ancestry.com, Land and Property Research in the United States by E. Wade Hone, Evidence Explained by Elizabeth Schoen Mills, the BCG Standards Manual, and The Researcher's Guide to American Genealogy by Val D. Greenwood. Those are some of the ones. There are many more that would be on my list, but those are probably the the top most essential ones. I left off the ones that are very specific. There are some that are crucial to me here in Massachusetts, but they don't really relate to all of you folks, so I just left those ones off. But when you're doing your own list, make sure you include those. Whatever is critical for you to have in your reference library. So maybe you have these books now and maybe you don't. Put together a list of the top 10 that you think you should have and just make a note of of what you do have and, and what you'd like to get sometime in the future. I hope you enjoyed this trip to Ireland today. I certainly did. Oh, that was so much fun for me. And, and I can't wait to head back across to Ireland in a little bit. Until next week, so long. <laughs>